Station Head of School of Education at the University of Strathclyde. Um, next time we've got Anna Cook, who's a primary six teacher and Strathclyde partner, and she works at Eastern Branchshire and also comes into the university. Um, next to her we've got Alan McKenzie, who's the Dep Deputy General Secretary sorry, for the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association. And then we have got, well it's not Graham Logan, he said his apologies. <laughs> uh, it's Lynn who's that we really appreciate you coming in and filling in for last minute. And she is our principal teacher and lecturer in School of Education at the University of Western Scotland. And then we've got our own Paul Campbell, B. Ed, Year 4 and founder and president of the CPD Strathclyde Society. So I'd like to open up to the floor to see if there's any questions for our panellists. <coughs> has been um, resolute in its, um, in its opposition, not to the, the principles of curriculum for excellence, which so it's a difficult to really uh, argue with, it's sort of motherhood and apple pie, but with the pace at which they have um, been made to develop. And our view is that the delay is essential um, if curriculum for excellence is indeed going to be the success that it probably deserves to be. And now I notice that our colleague, Trades Union, the EIS, um, at this week's AGM, which is taking place just as we speak, um, are going to say the same thing. Uh, my only comment is it's a great pity that they hadn't said it at the same time as we said it, and the delay um, and a proper pacing of this important change could have been made to effect um, essentially what, what should happen, and that is a successful piece of curriculum development. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I'll, I, I would like to, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll comment on this and give me a chance, I'll always say something. But, um, <laughs> so the, the thing about the, the curriculum for excellence is, um, as Alan said, it's, it, you know, there's a, a huge potential here. Um, and I, I would actually want to draw a distinction between what seems to be happening um, in different sectors. Uh, I think what you're referring to, you know, it, understandable um, problems appearing in, in the secondary uh, sector, particularly around examinations that are the culmination, it is someone, some might see, um, of, of the, uh, the 3 to 18 learning journey. Um, I would have to say that there's a lot of good things happening in the primary sector. Um, and, you know, if you're asking about the long-term viability, I would, I would remain very optimistic. Um, when the principles were first outlined and when the ideas first emerged um, around 2004, there was a great deal of enthusiasm at that time, uh, and I shared that, and I still share it, um, around the idea that we actually have something which isn't laid down and tightly prescribed, uh, but that is um, an ongoing work in progress. And this, to me, um, represents something which is appropriate uh, where we have a, a model of the teaching profession, uh, you know, where we're talking about uh, professional inquiry as a driver for the curriculum. Um, and I, I think that's a, a, a positive um, way to, to consider what, what the curriculum actually is. Um, something which uh, can be developed as an ongoing process. Before that, uh, previous versions were basically a desk exercise. Um, where every 15 years or so, um, an expert group would be uh, put together and they'd be closeted away for a period, and some colleagues here have been involved in that kind of process. Um, and out from that process would pop a description of uh, what, what the curriculum should be, and it would remain um, described in that way for the, <coughs> the next 15 years until the exercise was repeated. The curriculum for exercise was introduced as, an, as, a, as a new departure uh, in a sense, something which would be an ongoing work in progress. And I think that's the, the, the spirit in which we, would, we should take it forward. I can see that there are major challenges in terms of the, uh, the clarity and the need for precision in the arrangements made for the examination system. And I quite understand the, um, 
the, the, the concerns that are around that at the moment, and I think we need to address those. But broadly speaking, I would remain optimistic for a curriculum that, be, that reflects the kind of model of professionalism that we'd like to say should characterise the teaching profession in Scotland. I was just, from I'm talking from a pra practitioner's point of view and being based in school, um, and I think we've come a really long way with curriculum for excellence, and it's sometimes it's quite frustrating to still hear the introduction of curriculum for excellence when we feel as if we've been doing it for a very long time. But I feel, from what I see from the staff, that we are confident in the planning and implementation stages, and that there are lots of advantages to it, and we're really using them well in school, I think. The difficulties of assessing and in particular the reporting and reporting to parents and teachers are lacking confidence there, they're looking for guidance, they're looking for professional dialogue and support and that's the biggest problem for us at the moment just now. Um, it, it brings lots of opportunities for good professional dialogue but it's still, people are reluctant to put their head in the line and say that child is at that particular level because of the need for clinical directions but I think in terms of implementing it into the classroom, I think we're quite willing to do that, there's a lot of good to be said about it. I think um, I think they can be reassured because I mean the success of the, the hub schools. I'm thinking of the one in Kilmarnock, um, which I visited very recently, has been pretty good. You know they really have done a lot to, um, to bring forward the, the, the notion of a, a partnership between um, teacher education and the, the, the chalk face, if you like. So I, I wouldn't have any reservations about the school being able to take forward um, concurrently with, um, with you know, bigger educational establishments, properly trained teachers who, um, even in training, provide a tremendous um, degree of uh, innovation and of freshness to what young people will experience. So I would have no reservations at all about that. I think it's a thoroughly good idea. Recommendations. 
The actual recommendation is that uh, teacher education should be, or placements for teacher education should be carried out in schools that meet quality standards. There is no reference to hub schools in any of Graham Donaldson's recommendations. There is discussion of the hub school idea in the body of the report, but no recommendation about hub schools. Um, I, the only thing I would certainly agree with Anna, um, and yes, it's true that I would make the point, I, I'm not in favour of the idea of creating a two-tier system. I think uh, another one of Graham Donaldson's recommendations, which is a very important one, is that all teachers should see themselves as teacher educators. And that's a, an important point. It's a professional commitment um, that is part and parcel of being a profession uh, being a professional person that you are involved in the process of educating each generation, successive generation. I, what I think we want to do is um, to develop new models of partnership and those may well involve hub schools in the sense that there's a cluster of schools formed. Um, at any one time the development may be focused in a particular area around say uh, a secondary school and its associated primaries or some other form of clustering of, of schools so that the capacity to engage in the partnership can be focused at any one time. Um, but I think the model we should be looking at is that that process should be rolled out and progressively involve uh, all schools ideally uh, in the country but certainly the majority of schools getting involved in that process rather than it being focused exclusively on uh, creating a, a, you know, an elite two-tier system, which I think we would be, uh, certainly we would be opposed uh, to. And I, I'm quite confident that many of the uh, colleagues uh, in the local authorities with whom we are wanting to develop these partnerships also share that concern that this should be an inclusive thing uh, involving as many schools and as many teachers as possible rather than being restricted to particular um, individual schools that become a separate group. <laughs> um, I don't feel I can comment, well I suppose, in much detail because I don't know enough about hub schools but I mean I can really echo um, what Don was talking about in terms of the two-tier system because I think sometimes when you look at the, when they're bringing in different models within the edu in education, particularly seen quite commonly across world business models, whether that's um, um, performance pay, performance related pay, things like that, we see it a lot in the United States in some areas and certainly in England. And I just would say that I can echo the points about the two-tier system because we've seen um, a programme like the Academies programme in England which is set out it's supposed to be something positive and something good for schools and good for the children that are in academies. That's actually turned out to be something that isn't as nice as what the prediction was going to be. So there can be issues with the system that's set out with good intentions. And um, obviously any system that's um, of redevelopment or interest in a new model or a new approach to education is going to have positive implications, <coughs> but it's about being able to see further enough into the future to see what positive and negative implications there could be. Um, but I do think that while well, the model's um, still being still trialled, is that right? Um, it's still in that process. So I think I mean there's no point being pessimistic about the changes that we're seeing and they're trialling something new. And it's something you might not agree with it, but I think we could learn lots from it in terms of the practicalities of how these partnerships are developed between special teacher education institutes and the schools on the ground as well, and how the local authority has a role to play in that as well. I think there's a lot to learn, and I'm sure that when we see things in education as well, things, if things don't work, things are looked at again and redeveloped and looked at a model that's better. And while I may not agree with the hypothesis behind the um, hub schools, I'm confident that it will eventually result in something positive and good for children and young people ultimately. As a current kind of practitioner, have you got any views? <coughs> um, I think your question was about parents and about reassuring parents, and I think that um, it's something over the years I've come to see that parents want to know that somebody knows their child, they want to be able to come and talk to somebody that knows exactly what they're talking about, and so I think that consistency of contact is a really important thing that although there may be different teachers coming into contact with their child, there's still somebody that knows them well that they can talk to. I think communication will be a huge issue there, both within the school, so that everybody knows what's happening, and so that the parent reports something, you know what that's about. I mean, I job share, and that's part of my challenge of my job as well, is to make sure my job share partner 
knows everything that's happened during my part of the week so she can pick up and follow it. I think that that's really important for parents. I think that really intriguing is that somebody will know their child and they can have a conversation with somebody about it. Yes, and unfortunately that's all the time we've got for question time panels. Please show your appreciation for their time.